started. Uh, welcome everyone to this third section of the uh, Research Methods Division and the Karma Doctoral Student and the Junior Faculty Consortium of 2020. It has been an interesting year, uh, but we as the Research Methods Division have has been doing this online consortium for many years. Uh, so uh, we do uh, welcome you to join us and uh, for those of you who are new uh, to, uh, to the consortium, uh, we will have three panelists today. Uh, we have Santi uh, Fanari from City University of London. Uh, we have Mike Withers from uh, Texas A&M University. We have Betty, uh, Betty Jo uh, from University of Minnesota. Uh, let's give them a hand. Thank you uh, for them uh, for their time and effort uh, in today's session. Uh, and I am the moderator for today. Uh, my name is Zen Zhang, uh, and I will be saving everyone's questions from the chat function. Uh, so the video will be recorded today and made will be made available uh, online uh, afterwards, so that if anyone signed up but missed this session. Uh, they can view them. Uh, so I think we will not use the raise hand function, but instead, if you have questions for one or you know several of the panelists, you can type it up uh, in the chat function. I will be saving them and asking those questions after their presentation. So the flow for today, every panelist has about 40 minutes. Uh, and within that time uh, allocation, they present uh, first uh, with or without slides as they wish. Then we'll have a live Q&A function uh, section after that, all within the 40 minutes. So, uh, and also I want uh, to thank Kama and uh, for hosting this session. I want to thank Thomas Greg Hammer for, uh, for serving as the chairperson to organize everything. Uh, they have done a great job on this. So let's see, without further ado, uh, let's welcome Santi to give uh, his uh, talk on QCA. Santi, that's yours. Thank you, Zen, for uh, the nice introduction. And thank you, everyone, for being here. As Zen mentioned, I'm uh, Santi Furnari. I'm based at CAS Business School, which is the business school of City University of London. I'm going to talk about qualitative comparative analysis, or QCA. And uh, it's difficult to introduce a method, particularly if it's new in uh, just uh, 20, 25 minutes. So this would be an introduction. The slides would be shared after the talk. And as I mentioned, this would be recorded. I also welcome any questions after the presentation. I will try to keep it around 25 minutes uh, max uh, so they can entertain your questions afterwards. So feel free to make notes of uh, your questions while I'm going, especially if there are qualification questions. So I'm going to share my screen now, and uh, um, so you should be able to uh, see my screen. If you don't, please let me know. Um, and what you see here is just the uh, introductory slide and introduction to qualitative comparative analysis. The way I structure the talk is really in three simple steps. As I said, in 25 minutes, it's difficult to cover everything. But first, I want to give you a sense of what is QCA useful for. And particularly, you know, as we all know, uh, every method uh, is useful for certain kind of questions versus others. And so really, I would uh, like to start by giving you a sense of, uh, you know, what kind of research question QCA is good to address. And particularly put QCA in context with vis-a-vis -vis other methods, correlation methods on one side, the quantitative methods, and uh, case-based methods on the other side. A brief history of QCA, the origins of the approach in sociology and political science, and what, uh, what's happening in management these days, and how to do QCA in practice. This would be most of my talk, typical steps of a QCA study, and an example. Again, pretty, pretty brief, and I welcome any uh, follow-up questions on that. So, First of all, what is QCA useful for? Uh, QCA starts from an assumption that causality is complex. So the QCA is best suited to address causal complexity. 
And in management and in, in social science more generally, um, we know that most of the phenomena that we are interested in are actually characterized by causal complexity. I have just three examples here, innovation, firm performance, climate change, three phenomena that we know, we all know are uh, complex and they are causally complex in particular. What do I mean by causal complexity here? It means that first of all, uh, uh, the phenomenon or outcome that we want to explain as scholars um, rarely has a single cause, but it's rather best explained by a multiplicity, multiple causes that combine or configure together. So this is the idea of conjunction, is the first feature of causal complexity. And this is really about not isolating the effect of single variables or factors, but rather in terms of net effects, not thinking net effects, but actually trying to think in terms of combined effect, multiple causes combined. This is the intuition behind um, the idea of configurations or causal recipes that can affect an outcome or phenomenon of interest, okay? The second aspect of causal complexity is that there must not be necessarily one pathway or one configuration of causes to explain one phenomenon. There could be multiple pathways or multiple configurations. They are equally well suited or almost equally well suited to lead to the same outcome. This is the notion of equifinality or the idea that multiple pathways, multiple streets, so to speak visually, uh, lead to the same destination, lead to the same outcome, can explain the same outcome. This is the second important feature of causal complexity. The third one is that same cause can have different effects depending on the other causes with which it is combined. And it's the idea of causal, as causal asymmetry. So for example, you know, a large firm uh, may be, uh, the, the size of the firm may be uh, an, uh, uh, a cause of innovation because it provides resources. The larger a firm is, the more resources are there for, for innovation. But equally, uh, if combined with other, um, if combined with some other uh, variables like for or conditions like for example uh, a vertical integrated structure then maybe size is not necessarily uh, positive for innovation but it can also be negative because it reduces flexibility of the organization and may not lead to innovation but rather to stagnation so we have a sim uh, a the same effect the same uh, sorry excuse me factor or cause may have different effects depending on the other causes or factor with which it is combined, okay? It's not necessarily symmetrical as often assumed, as assumed by default in correlational methods, okay? So QCA is best suited to address situation when there is causal complexity. So to address causally complex phenomena, they are characterized by these three features, con conjunction, equifinality, and causal asymmetry, which are three components to causal complexity. Now, what that means, let me give an example. This is perhaps the, one of the most common uh, corporate strategy questions. So let's assume again a large corporate, let's say Disney, there are multiple business units within Disney, and we want to explain the performance of one single business unit of Disney, let's say the animation studios. And Greg, Thomas Greghammer, indeed my co-author and one of the organizers of this event and, and, and colleagues have been addressing uh, core question in corporate strategy, which is how do corporate level factors, for example, features of the corporate level, features of Disney as a corporate, combine with industry level factors and business unit factors to affect the performance of a particular business unit. They found in their study, which is a QCA study, by the way, all the reference will be at the end of the slides, they found multiple configurations according to the idea of equifinality. For example, they found two of this configuration. Large size of the business unit combines with a uh, diversified corporate, high resource lack, and a munificent industry to result in high performance. Here we have the recipe of the configuration. This is what the final outcome of a QCA analysis is, is identifying recipes of configurations of factors that together affects an outcome of interest, a causally complex outcome of interest. But they equally, they found another equifinal configuration where the effect of size is reversed, a small size and a diversified corporate, but in not highly competitive industry and with resource lack, 
result in high performance. So the same outcome, but different factors. And particularly what we see is that the effect of size can have an opposite effect on performance depending with which other factors it is combined. Uh, just as an example, um, a different example, the effect of water on our body can be good if we just drink water and, you know, for example, sugar, right? But if we drink water and some other element we, we combine with water, it can be negative for our, for our body performance, okay? So same element, water, depending with what we, with what, which other elements uh, we combine it with, can have different outcomes on, on uh, similar um, on, on, a, on a phenomenon. So this is the idea of asymmetry. And we also see reflected in this example conjunction with finality because we have multiple pathways to the same outcome and we have a combination of different factors. This is just one illustrative example to give you the idea of what causal complexity is about. Now, causal complexity is not really best captured by correlation methods on one side just because, and by no means uh, I mean to imply here that cause correlation methods like OLS regression are not useful. Of course, they are very useful to isolate the effect of variables by keeping under control, by keeping constant other variables. And for many research questions, we need to actually evaluate the, the net effect of isolated factors. However, by design, correlation methods have not been designed or structured in a way that allow us to fully capture cause of complexity. First of all, because they focus on net effects of independent variables, they indeed we assume being independent rather than focusing on conjunction. So basically, with the exception of simple two-way or maximum three-way interaction effects, it is very difficult to through a regression or to other multivariate techniques that are correlational to take into account complex combination of factors that go beyond the three-way interaction effects. And as we know, interaction effects become unstable and difficult to interpret in, uh, if we go beyond the three-way. On the other side, correlational methods are usually designed to choose the best fit model rather than uh, actually take into account equifinality. So they are designed for unifinality rather than equifinality. And finally, correlations are by design symmetrical. And so they then neglect causal asymmetry. And when, once we know that a factor is actually positively correlated with an outcome of interest, that means the reverse is also true, that actually the more of a factor, uh, the more of X means the more of, of Y, it also means the, 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 the less of X means the less of Y, right? So correlation, uh, correlations are, um, are actually symmetrical by design. And so they are not well suited to capture causal asymmetry. On the other side, case-oriented methods, qualitative methods like case studies, they are designed to capture causal complexity. And, and indeed, what we do often in case studies, we build a model, uh, imagine the typical grounded theory where we end up with a model where many, many uh, concepts, right, interact with each other and there are reciprocal arrows and it's dynamic process model, for example. But those are typically best suited to address causal complexity within one or a few, let's say a handful of cases. Think about the classic Heisenart method where she compares three, four, five cases uh, but it's very difficult to do that kind of analysis systematically across many more cases, okay? So systematic cross-case comparison of causal complexity um, is very difficult with case-oriented methods. That's exactly the sweet spot somehow the QCA is trying to capture. It's trying to bridge the best elements of case-based method uh, and the best element of correlation methods to analyze systematically and formally uh, patterns of, uh, of uh, causal complexity, okay? And what configurations are associated consistently with an outcome of interest. In fact, um, you could, in summary, just briefly, you can think of the question when to use QCA with this simple rule of thumb, and please take it as a rule of thumb, not as a hard set in stone kind of rule. Correlation methods are best uh, designed to address, they're very good to find out which causal factor or explanatory factor is the most important for an outcome. So isolate net effects by keeping constant the effect of other variables, right? QCA is actually good for finding out which causal factors combine to produce an outcome and what are their different configurations of, of causal factors and how these configurations are associated with the outcome of interest. Case-oriented methods are typically very well designed to uh, find out how causal factors combine. So the underlying mechanism and processes that may actually 
you know, under, uh, under, underlie the different configurations, okay? So this is a simple way in which I typically define the different, different ways in which you can use the different methods, okay? Historically, QCA, just to give you a sense of where it originated, it originated in sociology and political science. One book that I highly recommend is basically the foundational book that uh, the first systematized QCAs, uh, the 1987, the Comparative Method book by Charles Reagan. He has two follow-up books that are wonderful in 2000 and 2008. Uh, QCA was mostly used in 2000, before 2000s in sociology and political science. It was mostly used to what it, uh, at the time were called intermediate end sample of cases. So sample in between, uh, you know, um, 11 and 50 cases. For, and scholars usually, particularly political science, uh, scientists felt a little bit stuck in the middle because they had an intermediate sample of cases. They could not do a regression, but they could not do a qualitatively comparative case an, uh, analysis on uh, you know 40 cases they were just too many and uh, but actually from 2000 onward there have been a number of applications uh, of QCA management and we assist to exponential growth of QCA management organization studies and I just want to say this out loud to clarify that now QCA is used both for small end samples so let's say samples of 11 cases and beyond okay intermediate end sample like for example between um you know 20 and 50 cases and also large end samples of you know hundreds or even thousands of cases so what used to be the core features of qca back in the day is no more uh, constrained and there is software and i will say more about the software that is available that will help you in case you are interested use qca on very large end samples okay the other thing I want to say out loud, that no matter the kind of data you start with, it may be quantitative data, sort of secondary data, data sets that you have access online, or interview rich qualitative data, archival data, you can still use QCA. So QCA can be used with different kinds of data, okay? It's just the approach that is different. So this is just to give you a sense of how much QCA is growing. This is a review article that Virmut Nisanji, Thomas Grekamer and others, including myself, have done recently in 2017. And you can see that actually the publications in the major outlet in uh, business and management uh, using QCA is growing exponentially. And this is still the case beyond 2017. Um, I just want to give you a sense in the remaining time, and uh, we are roughly 10-15 uh, minutes, uh, and then I'll open up for questions, uh, around the, the steps, the steps to actually carry on our QCA studies. And you could look up at the, at the, also this paper that Thomas, myself, Pierre Fis and uh, Ruth Aguilera have done in 2018, again will be referenced in the last slides about, you know, the the uh, best practices for each of these steps, right? The first step is really, as in any other um, research, you need to figure out uh, the outcome of interest. What is the phenomenon that you want to uh, study and explain? I would call that outcome, but also the kind of factors, explanatory factors in correlation analysis that are typically called anal uh, variables, what are the factors that you think may combine to explain the outcome? I would call this step construct the configuration model and also sample, and you could do this again, QCA is quite agnostic, you could do it deductively or inductively. The second step, but is em I want to emphasize the configurational element of the model, because what happens there is they really, you need to have a reason to expect that these factors may combine together. You need to have a theory in a way, either inductive theory or deductive theory based on previous literature, or why these factors are expected to combine to produce the outcome of interest. Step two is calibrate the data that you have collected uh, on your sample into either crisp or fuzzy sets by setting, uh, or a combination of both, by setting meaningful set membership criteria, and then create, construct the, uh, and analyze the true table, and finally evaluate and interpret the results. Now, let me give, um, so uh, I will illustrate these steps with an hypothetical example that is based on my previous work with Anna Grandori. And the question that we were interested in analyzing was, is what are the organizational configurations associated with high performance? So by organizational configurations, I mean combinations of different organizational practice. This is in the field of organization design. Now, to build a, a configuration model, you could do it deductively and then review different theories about the outcome of interest, in this case, performance, and take explanatory factors that come from different theories. And then the question becomes how these different theories can be combined or integrated to explain the outcome of interest. QCA allows you to do that 
or you can start inductively. I've done the, this in previous work. Analyze and code your interviews, generate a number of, of categories, and then you want to see how they combine. The sampling is typically done via theoretical sampling according to qualitative case studies. I'll, I'll just going to show an example of deductive configuration model building. So Anna Grandori and I define on the basis of the theories that you see on the right hand side of this table a number of references. We try to integrate them and we say okay there are four kind of uh, cl we classify the kind of organizational practices that can be combined in four categories, market-like elements like pay for performance, bureaucratic elements like monitoring and formal rules, communitarian elements like knowledge management systems, and democratic elements like, for example, do employees have the right to vote in board of directors? So these come from different theories and our research question is like, how do these different theories and these organizational practices combine into specific configurations that are then associated with high performance, okay? And uh, what you do then, once you, and so, sorry, excuse me, just, just to give you, this was our configuration model, meaning that we identify through a review, systematic review of previous theories, a number of factors that we want to be uh, our variables or sets in, in, the, in the configuration model of interest. We have done this and then the next step then is calibrate the cases into sets. Now, usually in a correlation methods, uh, we will say that factors are called variables, right? Differently from, from that, in QCA, both the outcome, let's say what is usually called the dependent variable and the explanatory conditions, what they're usually called independent variables, they are all equally conceived as sets. And by sets, I mean conceptual categories that capture qualitative difference among cases. So, and these sets may be crisp, a one zero, either our case here is in or out the set of interest. So you have here the example of performance. If performance is the set, we're trying to say, firm one or firm two are these two of our cases in our data sets. How can we classify and code these cases? How can we assign them to the set of firms with high performance? So we, in this case, for example, firm two, we can classify that as a firm which uh, has high performance. It's a member of the set of high performing firms. And so we is inside the set, it's visualized as inside the set. Firm one is instead outside. So crisp set are usually uh, crisp in terms of clear cut distinction between either you are either a case is in or is out a set. Okay. And both our independent variables, so to speak, or explanatory condition are dependent variables, all of them are sets in, a, in QCA. How do we calibrate and assign cases to sets? We do this, this through a process of calibration. This is actually much more complex than we can possibly cover in just 20 minutes, but I invite those of you that are interested to dig further, for example, in the reading, through the reading that Thomas and others uh, put together in 2018, uh, how to calibrate. But in a nutshell, calibration is about establishing thresholds so that we can classify, for example, firms that have certain qualitative criteria as members of the set or, or outside the set. And those criteria are usually best identified as criteria that are external to the sample as, be, as based on the researcher theoretical knowledge or other contextual knowledge about where the sample is drawn. So once we do that, what happens is that we, and you can have different degrees of fuzzy set calibration. For example, it could be a crisp calibration or a three values fuzzy set calibration, one 0 0.50, a four values fuzzy set calibration, one 0 0.75, 0 0.250, and so and so on, okay? So there is degrees of continuity that you can use in fuzzy set calibration. Uh, once you do that, you start for your uncalibrated data sets and you see here the example of the data sets that Anna and Dori and I at worked on. So you have mass, bureaucracy, communitarian, democracy. These are the four types of organizational practices that we want to see how they combine together. We had an uncalibrated data sets and then we decided some threshold qualitative anchors and calibrated those initial data that were collected through a survey into a crisp set calibrated data set. So it was a one zero. And, uh, and we use both uh, some criteria based on theory and data external to a sample, but also some sample-based criteria, which is not necessarily a recommended option, but you could do in residual cases. And we created our calibrated case, uh, data sets. So the calibrated data sets is what you use then for the analysis in QCA. 
And the next step then is actually that the software that uh, I'm gonna say which software I'm talking about at the end of the talk, uh, there are a variety of those, creates a true table out of the calibrated data sets. And a true table is a table of configuration that lists all logically possible configurations out of your selected uh, explanatory conditions or, or, uh, or, or factors. So for example, here you have a list of six uh, uh, configurations, but there would be many more because the number of rows that you have in a two, true table is always equal to two elevated to K, where K is the number of explanatory attributes. This is because the true table will list also the unobserved configurations. They are not in your data, but they have, uh, you don't have data on, right? But then they're still logically possible. Okay. What the true table also will tell you is the number of cases that exhibit a given configuration and also the level of consistency. And the level of consistency indicates how many cases exhibiting the configurations of factors. For example, in this case, configuration number two um, uh, also exhibit the outcome of interest. So 0 0.85, given that this is a crisp set analysis, will mean that 85% of the cases that exhibit that particular configuration number two also exhibit the outcome, okay? And also it will list the logically possible configurations. Again, the reason why I'm, it lists the logically possible configuration, you can expand on that in a more advanced uh, uh, notion of QCTA. We cannot cover this now, but th th I just wanna say that they are, they are listed there as well. What then you will need to do is basically set some minimum frequency of the configurations that you would like to analyze as a minimum consistency. And there are rules of thumb, depending on the kind of research question, whether this is more inductive theory building, then you will typically analyze also configuration with only one cases because you are interested in discovering even new, not very frequent configurations. Or if you have a more theory elaboration, theory access, uh, testing exercise, then you will have a, a higher frequency. And also there are rules of thumb around uh, what's the right level threshold of consistency. Typically 0 0.8 is recommended. You want to basically analyze the configurations that are consistently associated with the, um, with the outcome of interest. Um, now, in the, um, what then the software does, it takes the true table and it uses Boolean algebra minimization, in particular a simple algorithm by which the software identifies what are the residual elements that are not necessary, that are somehow redundant, either they are present or absent, doesn't make much, much of a difference for the outcome. Look, for example, at this complex Boolean expression on the left hand side. What you see, for example, is that uh, the star symbol here is the end in, a, in Boolean algebra. So it means a combination of M, B, and C. So a combination of market-based practices, bureaucratic-based practices, and communitarian-based practices. And the plus sign here stands for the Boolean operator OR, or a combination of uh, M, B, and not C, because the lowercase letters typically indicates in Boolean algebra the absence of the element rather than the presence, which is instead indicated by the capitalized letter, um, will lead to performance. So the complex Boolean expression is basically saying, uh, that you see on your left hand side, is basically saying that you could get to P, which stands for performance, in two ways, either by using market-based elements and bureaucratic elements and communitarian elements, or by using just market and bureaucratic elements without uh, communitarian, element, uh, communitarian elements. What that means then is that C, communitarian elements, either they are absent or present, is gonna be irrelevant for uh, performance. So you could simplify these into a much simpler Boolean expression. And so you will uh, get a more minimized set of configurations that are consistently associated with the, al uh, with the algorithm, with the performance, uh, the outcome of interest, which in this case is performance. So by running, the software runs this Boolean minimization algorithm for you on the true table, and will identify the configurations that are consistently associated with the outcome. How would the, that results, uh, the, the, the results of a QCA, a QCA study typically look like? Here you have an example, again, based on, this is adapted from the study I've done in 2013 with Anna Grandori. You have on the, on the rows uh, labeled as one, two, three, four, five, the number of configurations that we, um, we identified through the QCA analysis. 
and you have as black circles here the presence of a causal condition or explanatory factor and as cross circle you have the absence and what you see here is that you have different recipes for high performance for example configuration number two here is an absence of market and bureaucratic elements but presence of community and democratic practices in uh, not high tech sectors will allow you to go uh, to actually obtain high performance a little bit like the study that thomas Grehammer and colleagues have done in the i uh, um in 2008 and and in the in but configuration three actually shows a different recipe where actually only market by based practices may be done by themselves sufficient to lead you to high performance in instead high tech sectors okay and you will have also two great two important measures of fit which are con coverage and consistency i explained what consistency is coverage instead tells you what the empirical importance of the configuration is on the overall cases that exhibit that particular configuration so sort of if there are a crisp sets it will mean for example that your model cover 0.66 of the cases in total so you can think of this as an equivalent although of course it's not the same over an r square okay so it tells you how much of the outcome has been covered by the particular configurations that you have identified and you will have coverage and consistency for each configurations and for the overall model okay and i uh, generally also as uh, in other cases uh, results are interpreted as configurations and so not as independent effects okay and there is some other reference re uh, reference they put down here as well as so this is what i wanted to share with you and this is also a page where you can download for free the software but i will share the slides and uh, i'm happy to entertain any questions in the time that is left thank you Thank you, Sandy. Uh, this is a very informative presentation of QCA. Uh, we do have quite a few uh, questions here for you, but given the time, we only have, have about five minutes left uh, for, uh, for your session section. I would like to ask uh, a few uh, simpler questions, and I can email you with my moderated question list to you uh, so that when uh, when other presenters are working on their slides, you can probably try to uh, respond in the chat function. Uh, sure. You know, if we do not have time to cover all of them. Sure. Let sure. me try to uh, share my screen a little bit with uh, my collection of questions here. Uh, just a second. Okay, let me see where, okay, here we go. I believe this is it. We no, no. Is it mm -hmm. there? Yes. Okay. Do you see yeah. the Do you see the questions? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So I can I can actually uh, you know uh, just repeat those questions. I added a little bit of my own question there. So the first one is about how large would the QCA typically allow theoretically, and what is the minimum allowed number? I guess yeah. you already answered it by talking mm -hmm. about the the trend. Uh, of that development. So uh, as you'll see in the next five, six years for mm -hmm. cutting edge QCA analysis, uh, what will be your recommended range of sample size? Yeah, so I mean the minimum has been uh, uh, typically the minimum recommended, but this is a, a, a rule of thumb is 11. Uh, there have been a few exceptions where, where the number of cases has been even fewer, like five. But actually what you can do with QCA for samples below 11, usually you can do it also with systematic case-based comparisons. So QCA in those cases becomes just a formal, more formal way, analytic way of showing cross case patterns of comparison. So generally is 11 as a rule of thumb. There's really not a, a, a minimum on uh, about, uh, in terms of the, the large sample, the maximum number of cases, okay? There's not a maximum number. There have been QCA studies done with thousands of cases. It's a very good question how to calculate the good sample size. It depends on the number of conditions or variables you have. There's an interesting paper that I will share in the references, 2006 by Axel Marx, that gives some benchmarks on how to get the number of cases depending on the number of conditions or variables that you have in your analysis. 
Okay, great. Thank you. So especially the second part about the power analysis. So mm -hmm. uh, I always, you know, sometimes joking with my students that, you know, in your dissertation proposal, that's probably the only time you do a power analysis, right? Mm -hmm. When you have your PhD, I mean, running regression, uh, sometimes it depends, you know, how, how large the sample size is, it depends upon your access to those mm -hmm. companies and mm -hmm. your resources. Uh, but I assume a similar, similar situation is here for QCA. Uh, can, can I just uh, read the most recent QCA publications? And as long as I'm choosing a similar sample size as they, they do in, the, in their studies, uh, can we be safe in that way? Or do, I, you, do you see the, the bar is getting higher and higher? No, I don't think the power is getting higher and higher. I think it really depends on the research question. And so I would go case by case in depending on your particular project and your particular research question. What are the explanatory factors that you think minimal, also from a theoretical standpoint, can actually explain the outcome, depending on how well the outcome has been studied before. So I would go more on a research question by research question basis, depending on the study. And, but there are also some empirically driven uh, benchmarks for um, fit of the model. And so that paper through simulation gives us some empirical criteria where we could look at how many uh, conditions can we use depending on how many cases we have. Okay, great. And the other way around, yeah. Mm, thanks. Uh, so the next question, I guess we, we are only able to cover this second one uh, and mm -hmm. save the others for, for the mm -hmm. chatting function. So would, could you please elaborate more on the sampling uh, of mm -hmm. your study, of your observations? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Is there like a, a random sample required or do, can, I, can we do a, a stratified sampling approach like in a population survey? Yeah. Uh, any suggestions on that? So usually QCA uses a theoretical sampling like qualitative case studies. So it's uncommon to find a random sampling. It's more common to find a stratified sampling when it's a large gen or a theoretical sampling that depends on the research question. So you start from the outcome and look what kind of cases can I collect depending on the outcome they want to explain. If you want to go for a very large gen, then you go for stratified sampling rather than random. I see. Great. So given the time, uh, I will be saving the three questions and emailing to you, Santi, so that, you mm -hmm. know, when you have time, uh, you can type in your answers to the chat function while the other panelists are presenting so that everyone can see your answer. Great. I will. And if, I, and if the participants want to ask more questions, I'm happy to take them either through email or I can, I can type also my answers to additional questions. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Sandy. Okay, let me stop sharing my screen. And our next panelist is Mike Wizards. And Mike, the floor is yours. All right. Well, let me echo Sandy and say thanks to the organizers. Uh, really a pleasure to be here with you all. And, and thanks to you all that are here this morning. Uh, so I am going to discuss panel level data. And so I'm going to share my screen here. And I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll just cut my video off so I'm not distracting myself, if that's okay. So um, let's see if I can. Okay, so I, I'm gonna talk about current approaches to analyzing panel data. And so what I'm gonna do today is really focus on a couple of things. One, I wanna provide just a bit of a primer over panel data, at least from the macro perspective and, and how in strategy we often think about panel data. And to do so, I also wanna look directly at the fixed and random effects estimators, mainly because that's the most typically used in, in strategy research. We are certainly seeing some trends towards some other methods, but those two still seem to, to dominate. Uh, building off that, then I wanna get into, if you will, three methods that are on the rise, at least from my perspective. One is the between within, or what's typically called the hybrid method. Uh, I'll also discuss dynamic panel models, and extended regression models. And, and uh, in a similar way, given the nature of this talk, uh, uh, these will be fairly high overviews, but I hope it'll be helpful for you uh, as, as we're going through. So um, probably a good place to start is to think about what panel data are. And so you can see here, this really refers to data that have two components to it, both a cross-sectional dimension as well as a time series dimension. 
And so you can think about a repeat set of observations over individual units, but really the main thing is we're following cross units over time. And so you can see here, we might have an individual and we're following them uh, from time one, two, and three. For my own research, I typically think about this in terms of firms being followed from time one, two, and three. So we're, we're following the same units over time. And so that creates this cross-sectional dimension as well as the time series dimension. And you know, from, from some of Zinn's research, you could really think about this kind of as multi-level data inherently, right? Longitudinal data, if you will, is a special case of multi-level data. We have time nested within individuals or nested within firms. And in strategy, we're typically gonna look at having the large N, small T, meaning that we might have, say, uh, the S&P 1500 that we're following, so we have at least 1500 firms, and we're following them over a relatively short time period, say, five to 10 years. And so this is typically what that data would look like in the long form, and that's, I think in most cases, how strategy researchers think about panel data in this long form. Uh, it should be noted though that you could certainly use wide form data where we might have uh, firm performance one, two, and three and board capital one, two, and three um, in that wide form for a structural equation model. And you could certainly treat, uh, treat that data that way and as longitudinal data. But in most cases, we, we have it set up here. Um, it's probably very clear to you that if you think about this, what we have again, is kind of that multi-level structure where this could be groups and our tie variables could indicate individuals within those groups. So a very similar idea that we're talking about when we look at longitudinal panel data in the, in the long context or the long form. Okay, so there are some key advantages that we have. One of the things that, that is, is, is clear is that we get more informative data. It, relative to cross-sectional data, we get greater variability, we get less collinearity issues because of that, we have more degrees of freedom, and we have greater efficiency. And so when I talk about efficiency, I mean the ability to, uh, to test our hypotheses directly. Uh, the efficiency, as it goes up, our standard errors actually go down, and so you're more likely to, to find those significance uh, uh, if they are truly there. Uh, it also allows us to examine research questions that we're just not able to do with pure cross-sectional data. And, and so that's the other thing. And then finally, uh, this last point, and this is probably most critical, is it allows us to control for unit heterogeneity. And so again, thinking about this, you can almost consider the ANOVA context or again, the multi-level context. We've got two different sources of variability here. And this variability allows us to really take advantage of, of all the considerations within the panel context. And so here we have within firm variance for firm A, as well as within firm variance for firm B, but then we also have this between firm variance. And this is where that unit heterogeneity comes up. And so if we take the basic regression model, you can see here where we have Y, alpha, some vector of X's and our beta, our, our parameter estimates, plus some U here, which is our, our error term. And so the panel data model then extends that. And so we do that by having this uh, Y sub I T, alpha plus our vector of X's, I T, beta, and we now have that uh, error term, which also is represented uh, by the, the IT. And so the I's obviously are representing that unit heterogeneity or that firm level, and the T's are representing the time component. So what we can actually do is take our error term here, our UIT, and we can split that into, in a lot of ways, that between and within variance components. So the, um, the unit heter heterogeneity here is kept, uh, captured by the new I. Then we also have this new IT, which is kind of that random error term component that varies over time as well. And so if you think back to that prior model, it really is where the, uh, the mu in this case is that between variance component. And then we still have that time uh, varying error component as well, which is reflected in our new IT. And so uh, taking that together, we get this panel level model, which is uh, extending the error term to split it out that way. So the critical question when we start to think about panel data is what to really do with that unit heterogeneity. As I said, that's a key advantage we have. So if you think about, say, a basic model here uh, where we took that, that panel data from before and now we have where we're predicting firm performance, uh, looking at board capital as one predictor of that. And so the critical question really becomes, well, what are we going to do with that unit heterogeneity? 
Uh, and you can see here the unobserved time invariant features of an individual firm may say cause firm performance to be especially high or low. You know, think about the research on, on say family firms from Anderson and Reeve, where they at least early on suggested that maybe family firms have a performance advantage. Well, if within our data, if, if family firm, uh, the family firm dimension doesn't change, and for some reason we're not able to capture that, that could all go into this, this unit uh, heterogeneity within the mu i here. And so what do we do with that? Well, we can try to remove it. And one of the easiest ways to do that is with the first differencing model. Or we can try to model it in one of two ways. And that really is going to be the focus of the fixed and random effects estimators. And then we can also try to control for it. I'm going to talk about that in the end when we think about, well, what if it's a dynamic process as well? So if we look at the basic panel model, again, you can see it's that, uh, that mu i that's creating the issue. And so from a fixed effect standpoint, maybe the best thing to do is simply to get rid of that component. And so what we do is do the within transformation, which we, uh, which we uh, take the clustered uh, means and we then subtract our observations from those clustered means. And then we're able to get uh, what is in, in essence this equation that then because mu i and the mean of mu i are going to in invariably equal zero, the fixed effects itself is move, uh, removed. And so if you look at, again, the example I was giving before, if we have, again, board capital as the indicator, well, we would need to get the, uh, the clustered firm level average performance and board capital, and then we would subtract those from, uh, from each of these to get kind of that within component only. Uh, this is uh, very much equivalent to putting dummy variables in there for every firm in your data set. Uh, so that's that least squared dummy variable uh, model that, that you can think about. And that definitely works. And in some cases, it actually works really well. Let's say if you're doing something like a, a negative binomial regression model, doing the dummy variable approach can, can actually provide a, some advantage over doing a panel level estimator. But the key thing here is that what we're looking to do is going back to our within and between variance component, we're just simply removing that between variants. And so that's why the fixed effects estimator is often referred to as the within estimator. It is only looking at within firm variance. So if you think about a hypothesis where we're saying board capital is related to firm performance. We're really saying within firm change in board capital is related to firm performance. And that's the only thing we can actually examine with the fixed effects estimator. The random effects estimator actually tries to take advantage of both the within and between, but to do so, it makes, a, makes a, an assumption about the mu i. What it assumes is that it's actually completely random. And so by making that assumption, uh, we're saying that the covariance between our xit and our mu i are, are equal to zero. And so that actually uh, still takes into consideration the fact that we would have zero correlation within the firms. Uh, within the observations within a firm, I should say, but it, it's looking to kind of take that that uh, take advantage of both the within and between. And so, in a lot of ways, with the random effects, you're actually adding that back in, and it's actually itself is a hybrid method between OLS regression and our fixed effects estimator. It's uh, doing a weighted average of the within and between variance. And so, typically, what we would see in strategy is that you would use uh, both method methods. And, and conduct a Hausman test. And in part it's because, well, if you think about what we're doing with the random effects estimator, we're making a big assumption. And so this is from Cameron Trevetti's great book on microeconometrics. Uh, but if you think about if, if our uh, estimators are down here, and so we've got pulled OOS, we've got the between estimator, which we don't see used a lot. We've got a within effects estimator, the first differences estimator, and the random effects estimator. And so if, if the true data is, is here where it's true pulled OS, you can see that all of these estimators are going to be consistent. If the true estimator is a random effects, you can see as well, uh, all of them are consistent. However, if the true effect is within, meaning that that unit heterogeneity actually doesn't matter, then you get inconsistency in your OS, your between estimator, and obviously your random estimator, because it's, it's again just taking both of those as a weighted average. And so that becomes kind of the critical thing. Uh, and I should say this is with the, the key assumption of strict exogeneity with the, the uh, new term as well, uh, the new IT. So in strategy, we actually have a number of different ways we approach longitudinal data. And, and I certainly could have thrown structural equation modeling up there as well, although we typically don't see that as much in strategy currently. 
Um, but you can see uh, we have methods that incorporate the between and within variants. And you can see here random effects, the mixed and multi-level models, which if you think about these two are equivalent if you don't do any centering approaches. So if you're on the micro side and you do that cluster mean centering for a multi-level model, in some ways, you're, uh, you're doing the same thing that the fixed effects estimator is doing as well. And then we have these generalized estimating equations as well. And those also are taking between and within variance together. And then we have only those that have the within variance. And so you can see the fixed effects and the first differencing are, are two of the big ones, obviously. Uh, the key problems here is that, again, you're using less variation, less variance. And so you're less likely to find uh, statistically significant relationships because they're less efficient. And also, you're not able to examine time invariant variables. And so, again, if we're using a fixed effects model, we actually wouldn't even be able to model family firms if they don't change within our data. And so, as I was mentioning earlier, strategy researchers are often fairly silent on how their theory and models kind of come together and match in some ways. We sometimes theorize one way, and then we do the Hausman test at the end, and we don't take into consideration that, well, our hypotheses should align with the method chosen. And so as I was saying with board capital, if the relationship that you're interested in is the within firm change of board capital on firm performance, then the fixed effects estimator makes a lot of sense. Um, and the other thing is that thinking about the effectiveness of those techniques that account for the between variance. And so um, one way to get at that is to use what's called the between within approach or uh, what Paul Allison originally called the hybrid method, but he's more recently started calling it the between within. And so this idea is really to take advantage of the benefits of both a random and fixed effects model. And the way you do that is actually to calculate two variables uh, in your data. You create a group mean variable or that clustered mean variable that I've been discussing. And then you, you uh, do the group mean centered where you would get uh, the deviations again. And so this uh, procedure would apply a random effects estimator to model both sets of variables, the group means and the mean centered variables. And so what you would do, say back to the example of board capital, would be to calculate at the group level, at the firm level, the mean board capital. And then you would, for each observation, subtract that, uh, that observation from the mean to get that deviation score. And you can see then we would put that back in our random effects model. And the really interesting thing is that in doing that, the deviation uh, scores here, that uh, I should say the, the uh, deviation variables, uh, those would actually give you the within effects estimator uh, as well. And so what you end up doing is getting the benefit of both models. You can actually um, uh, address the unbiased coefficients uh, that, that is mainly addressed in the fixed effects model. Um, and when you do this, the, the method should produce the same coefficients and standard errors that are identical to the fixed effects estimator. This is especially the case in strongly balanced panel data. Uh, it also allows you to, to model time invariant predictors as well though, which is uh, again, something that we can't do in the fixed effects estimator. It allows you to control for all those time invariant predictors, but it doesn't allow you to actually model them. And so with the uh, hybrid or the between within effects uh, approach, you can actually, uh, model those time invariant predictors as well. Uh, you can do much more sophisticated multi-level modeling as well. And so I said you would do this in the random effects context, but you could actually take a multi-level model and, and apply the, uh, the between within method. Uh, and, and it also allows you to do a direct test of the fixed and random effects coefficient in a similar way to the Hausman, but uh, in a much more direct way. It's also very easy to implement. Uh, it's easy to do through Stata with just a little bit of coding, but now we actually have a new, uh, a new command that's called XT hybrid that will do this for you as well, but really easy to implement too. And so that's kind of the idea of the between within or hybrid approach. Now we could think about how uh, the relationship that we're examining is maybe much more reflective of a dynamic process. And so if you think about what's the best predictor of future behavior or what's the best predictor of future performance? Typically it's past performance or it's uh, past behavior, right? And so if you look at firm performance, it depends on a lot of different things. Observed regressors, you can see here firm size, R&D, uh, but also some unobserved factors that we can't get at, right? And that again goes back to that discussion of the random effects models, but sometimes it also uh, has some lagged effects that are there. And that's what we're talking about with the dynamic model. 
uh, panel data really provides the advantage over cross-sectional data that you're able to man uh, you're able to model these dynamic processes and so um, developing a dynamic model is actually pretty easy although it creates a number of problems for us uh, it's easy because you can just simply include the lagged variable uh, the lag value of your y variable uh, the problem though is it creates a number of issues that we have to address and so you can see what we're looking to do is model those patterns of correlation across y and so you can include a lag value of that however for the traditional panel estimators the fixed and random effects they are biased and, and OS would be biased as well you can actually do this in a cross uh, a cross model context with structural equation modeling but for a fixed and random effects estimator it would actually bias those those uh those estimates and so the dynamic model uh model addresses this and so we have a couple of different approaches to that and so you can see this is the basic dynamic panel model all we're doing is again including at least the uh the t minus one of y and then what we have to do is is think about how to approach it and there are a couple of different ways from the econometrics literature that does this and uh, these are becoming quite popular in strategy research it seems like so uh, the first approach takes advantage of the first differencing estimator and so this was uh, Anderson and Xiao that, that introduced this in 1981 where they looked at well if we include a lag variable by construction it's correlated with our mu i again and so what the first differencing model does is difference that out uh, very similar to what we were talking about with the fixed effects estimator with that um, UI. And so uh, you can see here it addresses that that correlation between the mu i uh, t minus one and the mu i. And so uh, in this case though you can see the lags of the uh, y i t are still a function of our new i t. And so what uh, what they suggested was to use the u i t minus two as an instrument for u i t minus one. And so it's trying to address that endogeneity problem if you will. The Iono bond estimator, which has become extremely popular, took this to another step and said, okay, we can use that first differencing estimator, but now we can actually look beyond just yit minus two, but look at all the lags thereafter. And so again, it's still looking at the endogeneity that arises from the differencing equation, but it does so through uh, lags beyond yit too. And, and what it's doing is using the methods of moments, taking the idea that yit minus j uh, is not going to be equal to our our error term in this case uh, the new it and then taking this even a step further the ariano bond bover or blundell bond estimator actually takes advantage of the fact that we both have a differencing equation as well as a levels equation and by again using methods and moments we can get an estimate of that and use the differences and levels as instruments for these models now, as you can imagine, that's fairly complicated. And there's a number of assumptions going on with how you structure your lags and what you do. There are some key assumptions. So if you are looking at doing an Ariano bond model or any of these dynamic panel models, you have to make sure that the serial correlation of the difference errors is limited to a correlation with the first order. And there's no correlations of orders two or greater. And then you have to examine your instruments, i.e., are your, uh, yit minus two and three and four and so on are they actually good instruments and so you can actually test that directly with the sargon test as well and then you can see a key question becomes well how many instruments do we need uh, there's actually been some research that suggested if you have too many instruments that can actually create problems for you so a lot going on there and in part a lot of these assumptions are not often plausible or met in our empirical context so more recently, and, and I've not seen anyone using this method yet, but it's going to relate actually to some of the stuff Betty's going to talk about here. Um, using linear dynamic panel data estimation with maximum likelihood and structural equation modeling. And so this again is some work by Allison and colleagues that's been uh, trying to introduce this method, uh, taking a, rather than a GMM approach, taking a, a maximum likelihood approach to the, uh, the dynamic panel context. And so uh, what they've actually done is created a stata command which is simply a wrapper for structural equation modeling that allows you to include the, the uh, lag dependent variable in the model okay well, last thing i want to talk about was kind of thinking about endogeneity because that's certainly something that we often talk about in in strategic management research in particular and so if we go back to this uh, 
this relationship I was mentioning earlier, there's certainly some reasons to think about why forward capital might be uh, correlated with our error term. And here I went back to just the combined UIT, but you can think about there's a variety of factors that might drive why there could be endogeneity with forward capital. In part, Hermelin and Weisbach actually argued that board composition is endogenous, right? And so that could create a problem for us. We know that in the in the panel context, we could we could certainly use a two-stage least square method to get at that. So I, I don't want to focus on that. I actually want to focus on something else. The other thing we might have though is, is to complicate this a little bit more. If we move from firm performance in general to MA performance, then we are starting to add another component of endogeneity here. And so in this case, uh, the likelihood of MA uh, activity would would be equal to some selection criteria and so we would be missing m a performance if if the uh, firm didn't engage in an m a and that's kind of the classic sample induced endogeneity problem and then finally we have non-random treatment assignments and so again adding another layer of complexity let's say we're interested in m a performance and we're looking at board capital as a predictor but we also think that an important treatment effect is ceo succession well, I know some of you are saying, well, wouldn't that be endogenous as well? And, and that certainly could be the case, especially if you're examining something like CEO succession. And so that could create a problem if we're, we're interested in looking at that as well. And so in combining all of these things, what we actually end up with are some rather complicated models. But in the panel context, there's now actually a way to address these all simultaneously, which is, which is why I wanted to just mention this very quickly. And, and this is... Uh, something that that I know is within the, the Stata uh, kind of now preset commands, but these extended regression models allow you to accommodate sample selection, non-random treatment assignment, as well as endogenous covariates. But what really makes them really unique is that you can actually do this in a combined single model. And so uh, some of the principles are very similar to what we would see, say, in the two-stage least square approach, the Heckman selection correction models, as well as endogenous treatment models. Let's say we're doing a switching regression or something like that. But now you can actually do that all within one command and really in one model. And so allows you to think about the complex nature, especially within in uh, management research, I think in general. And so really kind of interesting to see these type of methods. And so just to summarize real quickly, um, Something that I think we, we all need to do when we're, we're looking at panel data in the macro context is to think about it from the variance components uh, and, and really think about what's going on. And I think um, recognize that what we're doing is not too dissimilar from what our micro colleagues are doing with multi-level modeling. And uh, when you're thinking about the traditional panel data, data estimators, really recognize that your fixed effects models are only focused on that within variation. Your random effects is doing a weighted combination. So they're doing something very different in many cases. And then uh, if you're looking at dynamic panel models, uh, recognize that uh, you certainly have that advantage in, in uh, panel data, but uh, there are a number of assumptions that need to be met. And I, you know, I think from my perspective, it's gonna be interesting to see if the, uh, if the dynamic panel approach with uh, the uh, maximum likelihood becomes more popular on the macro side as well. And then finally, again, as I was saying, given the concerns around endogeneity in, in panel context, now we have these extended regression models or ERMs that are available to us that, uh, that we can take advantage of as well. So uh, thank you. And, and uh, similarly, uh, here are some, some key references from, from the talk uh, as well, which I'll, I'll share too. So, and I'll be glad to, to answer any questions. Thank you, Mike. I do collected a few questions for you. So let me share my screen uh, for the set of questions. Okay, are you able to see uh, my screen now? So I will also read it, read it loud. Uh, so first question about your panel data uh, presentation is, do you recommend wide format data for developing a baseline model before developing a panel model in long format. Uh, yeah. Thoughts? yeah, this is a really interesting question, in part because I think, um, at least in how I was trained, I don't really think about panel data in the wide data context, which is, or that wide data format, which is interesting. I really think about it in the context of um, the example I gave where you would have the structure where 
you'd have a year observation for each of your firms uh, within within your sample. And so um, I, I've just recently started to get interested in these uh, maximum likelihood models where you certainly could start with a structural equation model, which I think is going to lead right into some of what Betty's going to discuss today as well. Uh, and, and you certainly could do that. And you, you actually would have some advantage. Now, the one problem would be it gets fairly complicated, obviously, as, as uh, our, anyone on the micro side knows. And so if you think about the data that we're often, often dealing with, it, it can become rather complicated. So to be honest, I would typically think about panel data in the long format first um, and uh, just recognize that there are some different ways to approach it now. And, and actually the, the, uh, the XT DPD ML, which is the state of command for this uh, new estimator, as I was saying, it's a wrapper for SEM. And so what it actually does, is it converts your long data to wide to create the structural equation model and then goes back to long. So uh, I think it's almost for the econometr econometricians as well as the strategy researchers who just think about panel data in the long form. Yeah, and that command can simplify things so that you don't have to worry about errors in your own transformation. That's exactly right. And, and uh, it, it deals with that and, and does provide you with quite a bit of flexibility. It does allow you to model that lag dependent variable. It allows you to address the fixed effects. It, it does a lot of a lot of really interesting things that, that I think uh, obviously our micro colleagues have known for a long time. It's just that sometimes we don't communicate across the two areas as well maybe. So uh, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, second question is about uh, the unbalanced panel data. Does that unbalanced data pose any threats to hybrid method, the between within method? It, it doesn't. So um, what, what we were, what we actually found is we, uh, we replicated a study, uh, Chen and Miller 2007, and uh, I, I couldn't get their estimates exactly right. And it was because it was on panel, it was unbalanced data. And what I ended up doing was having to simply, which is a little weird, but we often include um, time dummies or, or binary variables for the time variables in our data. And so I actually ended up doing the same transformation on those variables and it, it then gave me the exact same results. Now in general, and I, I saw this question pop up as well, missing data, as long as we can have that at random assumption, which I think we would say for all missing data cases, right? You can go to Paul Allison's book on data, uh, missing data and look at these different approaches. Uh, as long as it's that in some ways that it's not creating a sample selection bias problem for us. Um, panel data can actually handle uh, unbalanced data pretty easily. It, it can handle missing data in a similar way that OLS would. Now, I guess the, um, the advantage that, uh, that you might have, say, again, within the structural equation modeling is you could actually do something like uh, full information maximum likelihood, which would give you an advantage, which, again, we often don't think about on the strategy side. So just kind of interesting as well. But, Unbalanced panel data is not going to be a problem for you. Mm -hmm. Great. So question three is about uh, a paper that you are a co-author on. I remember that paper from last year. So uh, do you have any thoughts on using this ITCV for showing that there is no omitted variable pairs? Yep. And so we're, we're working on that paper right now. And so uh, this is a, a paper with uh, John Busenbark, who I think some of you probably saw last week in, in the... Uh, this research method session, uh, along with uh, Danny Gamash and, and uh, one of his doc students at UGAL. Uh, and so this is taking a, a, an idea that, you know, we can actually get a sense of how big uh, an omitted confounding variable might be, and that could provide at least some index to understand how large an omitted variable bias uh, could be in our model. And so in a lot of ways, it's focused on statistical inference. And so if you think about understanding causality, uh, certainly there can be endogeneity that makes our parameter estimates biased and even slight endogeneity can create some bias in your parameter estimates. It's not giving you the true value. But if we think about statistical inference from the sense of, well, are we actually seeing true relationships? Well, this index can actually say how large would a confounding variable have to be to change that statistical inference? In other words, to change the significance of your focal independent variable. And so, um, we actually think this is really useful and uh, my co-authors uh, did a, uh, a content analysis of SMJ looking through the effect sizes and actually found that in general 
it seems like there, there's certainly bias that can arise, but the, the change in statistical inference is actually not as large as, as we sometimes would think. I, now, I will point out, this only is focused on the omitted variable bias problem. And so OVB is, is certainly one of the big drivers of endogeneity, but there are other ones as well. Uh, certainly on the strategy side, we have measurement error problems that arise from using proxies. Uh, there could be that uh, simultaneity problem that could arise, and obviously you could have sample selection bias. But I think this is a really good place to start to say, well, do we actually have OBV in our model? And the ITCV, which also, uh, so I'm a Stata user, and so I think a lot through Stata, there's a Stata command, the K, uh, K found, uh, confound, with, it starts with a K. Uh, but there's also a spreadsheet that is on Ken Frank's website. I know that John is also writing a chapter with, uh, with Ken Frank, hopefully I can mention that. Um, but uh, they're writing a chapter that, that's trying to take some of these methods and bring them into the macro context as well. And then as Zen was saying, we've got a paper we hope will be out there at some point on this method too. So, uh, and looking at that and uh, yep. So uh, I, th I think it's a great tool, it's, but it's just really another one that's in your, in your tool kit, if you will. Uh, endogeneity, I think it is, is a big concern. And so we have multiple methods to, to try to get at that. We know that two-stage least square is a good approach to do it if you have good instruments, but it's not as efficient and sometimes can create more problems. Uh, and so having other things like this uh, can be really helpful. Um, and so, yeah. Thank you. So I definitely agree that we are all dependent on the software we use, right? <laughs> so like in M+, the software that I often use, uh, the wide format data is probably you know, as often seen as the long format data. So we had to try to, you know, reshape it uh, very frequently back and forth. The, the interesting thing I will say, I, because I've, I've never even opened M plus, right? So it's kind of, kind of interesting, but now the, uh, the command I was talking about for, for using this uh, maximum likelihood approach to longitudinal data or dynamic panel models actually will produce the M plus code you need as well. And so from Stata, you get the M plus code that you could share with co-authors, uh, especially if you're doing something across the two areas, which would be, which would be really interesting as well. So yeah, yep. we see more integration between the software platforms. Like in R, you could actually run M plus or maybe Stata uh, within our environment. It just uh, it connects, you know, just communicate with the other software in your, uh, on your uh, computer. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the the question number four. We may have more questions while we are answering those. Uh, so I, I suggest that you know maybe uh, when Betty is presenting, Mike, you can try to see whether there are new questions popping up while we are talking about this list. So number four is uh, to what extent are independent variables that are similar to each other, like the birth year, based age, and the membership in your generation. Do they create a problem for uh, panel models? They, they certainly can. Um, and this is uh, directly tied to some of the ideas around multicollinearity, I think, and directly where you might have, so in this example, birth year based chronological age, as well as membership and generation, you know, it could reflect some underlying construct, right, that, that is reflected in both of those two things, uh, you know, some view of, of a generational view or something like that, right, that, that could be captured. And so that underlying construct can create this, this collinearity between these two variables. Um, Wardridge does a really nice job in, in his textbook talking about this. Uh, whether you're looking at the more advanced version or even the introductory econometrics book, he does a really nice job talking about this. Uh, Kaunik's uh, recent SMJ, I guess it was within the last year or so, uh, looking at, at multicollinearity as a major issue in strategy, I think as well, might be very informative in this case. Um, because you certainly could have those issues that, uh, that could, uh, you know, would create issues in the OLS context in general, um, and certainly in the panel data approach. And, and in part, that makes sense, right? Because if you think about how we're modeling panel data, the nice thing that the fixed and random effects estimators do is that they, they get the coefficients that you would get, but they also address the standard errors to take into consideration the non-independence, which I, I didn't mention. But same problems that would arise here with, with kind of that multicollinearity if, if they're highly correlated and if they're similar because there's some underlying construct. To me, that starts to sound a little bit like endogeneity, to be honest. I know that uh, Kaunin kind of talks about that not necessarily being separate ideas, but, but I think they're at least related enough that it is something you'd want to think about 
and something uh, that is a really good consideration. I think in general, if you look at some of Brian Boyd and, and uh, Dave Ketchum's work on, on constructs within strategy, I think some of this too is because uh, on the micro side where uh, the real advantage I think is having that, that, uh, that ability to capture these things more directly. On the strategy side, we're often thinking about how can we proxy for something? And so you can see even in Zen's example, those could be proxies for something we're trying to capture. But once you start doing that, um, you know, if, it, if it's trying to capture the individual's views and how that might influence their action, that's going to be something that, that certainly needs to be taken into consideration. Again, it could be another context where applying multiple, met, uh, multiple measures and using the structural equation models more directly in, in strategic management, which Brian Boyd has been, has been uh, championing for a number of years, could be, could be a way to, to get around that as well. I, I, I think uh, recognizing these things, though, is certainly, certainly critical. Great. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. So uh, given the time, uh, let's move on to Betty's presentation. And of course, if the audience uh, have more questions, feel free to use the, the chatting function and uh, the panelists will be happy to address questions uh, in that format. Okay, let me uh, stop my sharing and give the floor to Betty. Go ahead. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Thanks, Jen, and also Thomas for organizing the session. It's a great pleasure to spend these two hours with you all. So uh, my part of the presentation and Q&A will focus on some of the tools that um, micro OB oriented researchers may be considering. So There we go. So um, here's a plan for um, my presentation part. So first I will talk about briefly what is, a, um, what is longitudinal research. In addition to the data analysis piece, what are the considerations for theorizing and also research design so we can get the data uh, we're going to analyze and answer our research question. And then I will provide a high level overview of some of the tools that are popular in micro research. Um, so I will include some figures, including some numbers, statistics, but just for illustrative visual aid purpose. Um, if we have questions about those, we can revisit, but my um, description will stay at a high level, uh, mainly focused on conceptually, what are the questions we can answer by using these tools. So I will go over a few tools that has been very popular in OB, OB micro research. So before we get into the statistics, um, I want to emphasize a good longitudinal research really requires three elements altogether. The first one is well-articulated theoretical model. We want to be very clear on what is a research question we're trying to answer. So later we can specify our statistical model in a consistent way so we can answer those questions. And the second key element of a good longitudinal research is a good design, especially um, for those of us who uh, do research in the OBE micro field, where we often not only use archival data, but we also um, collect data ourselves through primary studies. So a good longitudinal design is also very important before we move on to think about data analysis. And lastly, which is the main focus of our discussion today, is statistical model that's specified in the proper way so to allow us to answer the research question. So these three elements work hand in hand to allow us to generate high quality longitudinal research. So just a few words on the theorizing side, because sometimes when we, um, when we are not very clear on theoretical model, it's also, uh, as a result, maybe we are misspecifying our statistical model and testing the wrong thing and drawing the wrong inference. So when we talk about changes, um, which is uh, one of the main reasons we do longitudinal research, when we talk about changes in OB micro research, we can be talking about um, different things. Sometimes in one theoretical model, in one research, we are analyzing multiple of these things simultaneously. Sometimes we're focusing on one of the few possible elements of change. So the first question I think needs to be clarified is what is an intra-individual? If individual is a unit you're analyzing here, it can also be intra-teams or intra-other kind of subjects you're studying. So what is the um, change we're talking about here? Are we interested in what is the levels of change in the in a continu some sort of continuous outcomes? For example, our, um, our income, for example, 
of workers, or are we talking about some type of transition across different qualitative states in categorical outcome variable that's changing over time? For example, in micro research on careers, maybe we're analyzing are the workers transitioning in and out of employment status versus unemployed status? Um, and the second question is, are we interested, and if so, what is the form of change? Are we interested in the growth over time, in a linear form, in a quadratic form, in a, piece my, a piecewise way, or some other form we're interested? And also, it's possible that we're not only interested in the growth, or instead of growth, we're interested in some sort of inertia or carryover, or on the reverse side, we're interested in the stability of a system. So that can be another type of question we're asking about change in, inside the unit, inside the individual, for example. And sometimes we're interested in cycles, sometimes um, cyclical patterns, we're interested in reactions. For example, what happened on a particular day or within a particular event, and then how does the subject we're studying, for example, the humans react to the event. And is there a series of different events, a series of different states within the same subject, and we'll study their different outcomes at different time points. And in micro research, um, we are often not only interested in describing these intra unit, intra individual change, but we're also very interested in understanding what is the between person, between subject differences in these intra individual changes. For example, do uh, people differ in their growth pattern? Do people differ in their inertia or carryover effects? Do people differ in the cycles of the, the outcome we're studying here? And sometimes we're interested in subpopulations or class, cluster, clusters. Within the general population we study, if there are different subpopulations and different subpopulations have different patterns of the intra-unit changes. Maybe different subpopulations will differ, have different growth form, different populations will have different cycles, different subpopulations may have different reaction patterns. And in addition to describing the changes, um, our micro theories are also often concerned about explaining the, explaining the differences and also see what are the consequences of different types of changes. So the explanations, the antecedents, and the outcomes, the consequences can reside at both the intra-unit level, intra-individual level, or it can also be at the between-person level. So there are many different ways we can use to describe changes and explain changes. And as a researcher, the first step is very important to first clarify what is our theory. And then once we um, clarify our theoretical model, before we get to analyze the data, we need to collect the data, either through analyzing coding archival data or um, going through primary data collection. So these are three general types of longitudinal design we are often that's often using OB micro research. The first type of design is panel design, which um, Mike's presentation focused on data resulting from this type of design. So in panel design, we also often have a large number of participants or large number of subjects we study, for example, people or teams. And we have relatively smaller number of time points, for example, three time points or four time points. Uh, it, it's a relative term. And then the interval between the time points are relatively longer than the other two types of design. And when we use this type of design in micro OB research, we're often interested in understanding some sort of trend um, in the population, for example, the growth, either it's a linear form or in a quadratic form. Um, researcher, when, you're, when we are using this type of design, we should be mindful that it's possible because the interval between time points is relatively longer, we may miss some meaningful fluctuations between the time points that's just not capturing our data. The second type of design that's very popular in OB micro research is single subject design when we try to understand one particular unit, um, for example, one type of workers, maybe we only have a handful of participants, but we have a lot of data from each single subject. And then the interval between the observations is often shorter. For example, we may follow um, some house workers who are treating special cases, for example, right now maybe treating COVID cases in a type, particular type of um, public health setting, and then we observe them every, uh, every day or every few hours, and then we have many, many data points from the same subjects. 
it, when we have this, when we use this type of design, we often try to answer questions related to auto-regressive relationships. How do subjects prior experiences and states influence their later states and experiences sometimes on the same outcome variable? For example, how do the house blockers um, prior emotional states influence their later emotional states? And since we have limited number of subjects, um, and each time we're only analyzing one subject, we may face, uh, we, ha we have to be honest that we have limited generalizability across different participants, different um, persons. And we, uh, we also now see more uh, research using the third type of design, which includes the features of the first two types of design. We have large number of subjects, and from each one of them, we have large number of date, uh, time points. And then we have shorter interval between the time points. So this type of design will allow us to answer questions related to both within subject variances as well as between subject variances. So in addition to choosing the general type of design, we're going to use another, uh, a, a few other issues we need to consider, which later can affect our data quality or the type of question we can answer using our data. So for example, how are we going to sample our subjects? I think earlier in the chat, some, um, some but some of you guys also asked about this question related to quality research as well as strategy research. So um, when we try to think through the sampling subjects, we, um, we need to ask ourselves, what is the set population we're study here? And what is the between subjects or between person differences we want to capture? And how do we best go about and get a, the participants for example, this primary data collection, so we can answer those questions. And also when we are designing primary data collection or coding archival data, we need to be specific on what is the window of our study, what is the starting point, and what is the ending point. Here I have an example from a newcomer research. For example, do, you, do we start to follow the newcomers on day one or day, day 10 after they start their new job? And do we end in week three or or mastery. These are different choices that's tied to our research question as well as the phenomenon we're examining here. Maybe for some jobs, for some newcomers, the, um, the socialization happens very quickly and within 10 days it's already finished. So if you start your data collection on day 11, maybe you already missed the critical window. Maybe for some jobs, some contexts, the socialization happens through a longer period of time, then um, you need to extend your study longer, maybe end your study after three months, after 100 days, um, choices like that. And also we need to decide what is the timing of each measurement, what is the frequency of our measurement, and what is the interval between our measurements, and when are we um, collecting data, when are we coding the data, what is the window for each measurement. These are critical choices as well. Later, uh, I will briefly mention unplanned versus planned missing data. So some of these choices may, may result in quote-unquote planned missing, and um, it's not a problem for us to handle through statistical analysis, but it's, some, it's, it's a choice that should be debated and considered by the researcher rather than um, implemented later on in a post hoc way. So um, when we use these three general types of longitudinal data collection design or coding design, then we will have data that fall into one of these three buckets. Um, so assuming we're treating continuous outcome variables here. So then if your data comes from a design that allows you to have data from relatively fewer number of locations, from many, many subjects, and on either uni outcome variable or multi outcome variable. Then in OB micro research, we often use the tool called cross select model, uh, growth model, latent change score model to analyze data collected in this type of format. Uh, in the middle part, in the yellow cubic cubic here, you can see um, it's also possible we have data from a limited number of subjects, but we have many, many observations from the same subject, um, either uni or multi-outcome variable. So here is where we will often use time series analysis. Um, in the third scenario, where we have the combination of both features from the previous two, where we have observations from many subjects on many occasions, so uh, a new tool that's emerging, um, hopefully will um, get picked up and become popular in OB micro research, is called Dynamic SEM. Um, it's essentially multi-level time series analysis, which will allow you to analyze data collected in um, this type of design. In addition to these tools that's already uh, popular in OB micro research, 
there are also a few other tools that's on the rise or has actually, actually some of them has been popular for a while as well. So one tool is called survival analysis, uh, which is actually an umbrella term for a family of different types of tool. So when we use survival analysis, we're trying to answer questions regarding when does a critical event occur. So a classic example in OB micro research will be turnover. So after an employee joining a firm, an organization, how long does the employee stay with the company before the employee ends the employment relationship? So when we use survival analysis, we're trying to understand um, both describe and as well explain uh, what will predict how long the employee stay with the empl employer. Um, so when does a critical event occur? And the, a second type of analysis is called latent transition analysis, where we can actually focus on um, transitioning across different categories, for example, employed, unemployed. And over a long period of time, how do people transit in and out of these different states that's qualitatively different from each other. And also I uh, listed a few tools here that's um, becoming more popular in OB micro research. For example, um, residual dynamic structural equation modeling where we, we specify the relationships across the residual terms to represent the autoregressive relationships and then still maintain the, the feature of traditional structural equation modeling where we care about the structural relationships across different variables. And also latent differential equation model is another one that's becoming popular where we use derivatives to describe what is a process in the dynamic system. So we can describe when one variable change in this in certain um, for example on certain rate what are the changes on the other variable on a different rate and how do these different rates relate to each other and uh, another tool is called spectral analysis where we are describing the same time series but instead of using a variable's prior state to explain its later state we um reconfigure this and use different properties of different frequencies to describe the, the same time series. So uh, if you're interested in patterns of things that's occurring at different frequencies and how do they all combine to generate the data we observe in a time series, um, this is another tool that's, um, that you can consider. So here are a few tools that's already been very popular in OB micro research. I will quickly go over uh, what are the questions we can answer by using these tools. So one model, one, one tool is called cross-select modeling. Um, so when we use this tool, we're often curious about what is the autoregressive relationship of a variable itself over time, and what is the relationship between two or multiple sets of variables that are both changing, that are all changing over time. So uh, an interesting point um, Mike mentioned in his talk in the Q&A section, so um, in strategy research, people often think about panel data in the, in the long format, in the stacked format. Um, when you use SEM approach to handle longitudinal data, you often see we, uh, the default is to, to, to organize your data in a wide format. And here's an example. So we have data collected uh, on two variables at six occasions that uh, the, both of these things are changing over time from um, a number of participants. And when we organize our data, if you are going to use the structural equation modeling software to, to do the data analysis, you can organize the data in this type of wide format where each column will be one variable's observation from one particular occasion. And since now we, in this example, we have two variables, each have six occasions, so we will just have 12 different columns to organize the data. So when we organize our data this way, it's, it's called a wide format. And uh, if you use the cross-select model, then we can answer questions like, how does the uh, how does x variable at time t minus one influence the y variable at t, as well as the x variable's level uh, or the value at uh, at time t of itself? A second type of tool that's very popular is growth model. Um, and we can set this type of model up in two different ways, corresponds with different type of software environment, but mathematically they're, they're interchangeable. So the first way we can set up a growth model is using structural equation modeling software or do it in an SEM approach. So sometimes people also call this type of growth model latent growth model because we're using latent variables in the SEM environment to uh, represent conceptually what is the starting point and what is the rate of change. So uh, on the graph here, you can see there are two latent variables here. One is we call it intercept, which represents where do all these uh, changes start for all the different subjects, different people. And the other thing, latent variable is called slope, which represents how fast is the change, is the growth for different subjects. 
for different, for example, for different people or different teams. So for both of these latent variables, we can have the average term, which is uh, represented here in a small triangle and with a one in here. So this is an average starting point of intercept and the average growth rate for all the people in this population we're studying. And in the latent growth model, we can also consider what is the variability across different subjects, for example, across different people on, the, on both the starting point of their growth as well as the variation in how fast they grow. And then as you can imagine, on top of this descriptive model, we can add some variables to explain the differences across different people in where they start in the growth process and also add antecedents or predictors to explain what are the differences what explains the differences across people in the slope, in the rate of their growth? Um, and, we, uh, and we can expand this way of thinking about growth into multivariate. So for example, we are interested in how, what is the growth form of one variable called X and what is the growth form of the other variable Y and then how do their growth parameters correlate with each other? A second way to set up a growth model is to think about it in the multi-level modeling framework. So here, you, if you look at the equation in model one, we have, we introduce some additional variable called time, time. So what is the time of your measurement to help us describe what is the, what is the level of the variable and what is the relationship between time as time goes by and what is the level of the variable. So here at level one, we have a predictor called time and the coefficient associated with this predictor beta sub one i represents the, the, slope, the variation of the slope. So if you look at, if we're moving this parameter to level two, then again, we can decompose this into two elements. One is what the gamma sub one zero, which is represents conceptually what is the average rate of growth across all different subjects. And then we also have the residual term here at the higher level of the model, which represents the variability across different subjects, not only in the, in the rate of the growth, as well as the initial starting point or the average. Another tool that's very popular in OB micro research is latent change score model, where we um, are particularly interested in what is the amount of change from an earlier time point to the next time point. Here on this slide, I have an example to show a two occasion latent change score model. So this delta here is a latent variable that represents conceptually what is the amount of change from time one to time two on this outcome variable. So when we um, parameterize our model this way, then we can also introduce predictors to help us answer questions related, directly related to the amount of change from one occasion to the next. So for example, G can be some individual differences, for example, personality variable or demographics that will allow us to explain what is the average amount of change from one occasion to the next. And often more importantly, what explains the variation across different people in the amount of change. And latent change score model can also be expanded to include multiple occasions as well as multiple various. Um, and I know the graph here is really busy and overwhelming, just to um, just want to give you guys some resource to take away that we can expand the latent change score model to two variable situation, even three variable, multivariable situation where we can explicitly test hypothesis mediation hypothesis about how does the change in one variable relates to the change in a mediator and relates to the change in a more distal outcome variable. The last tool I want to cover here um, is survival analysis. So let's go back to our turnover example. So maybe we're interested in for a group of newcomers once they join the company for three months and when we have data about them from every week for the first 12 weeks, what is the likelihood for a newcomer to stay with a company or on the other side of the coin, what is the likelihood of the, the newcomer to leave the firm? So we can use survival analysis uh, tools to describe and answer this type of question. Uh, one, one tool that's very popular is called discrete time uh, hazard model. So when we use this model, we're trying to see what is the base rate of the hazard uh, here to leave the company to turn over for a group of newcomers with certain attributes. So in a hazard model, we will use a logic function and the predictor will include both the base hazard rate at each time period we are observing them as well as what is the change due to some sort of covariance we have. 
So just uh, before I wrap up, I want to uh, highlight a few issues that we need to consider before we jump onto the analysis in OB micro research. The first thing is measurement invariance. Also in Mike's talk, uh, he mentioned in, in strategy research, now there's also discussion about using multiple indicators to capture the same latent underlying factor. So in OB research, there's a long tradition of using multiple indicators, multiple items to reflect the same underlying factor. So when, uh, when we have measures like that, we need to first establish we are using the same measure really capturing the same thing over time before we move on to test the structural relationships do these latent factors actually change over time so the take a step back we need to first answer the question are these latent factors reflected in a consistent way among the different indicators observed at different time points and the second critical issue to think through uh, before getting to the analysis is how are we going to handle the missing data is the missing data coming from plant missing where maybe we intend had different intervals, uneven intervals between our measurements, or is the missing data coming from um, things we didn't plan? So um, a general suggestion is to use maximum likelihood or multiple imputation estimation methods rather than uh, using single imputation or even um, just remove the cases where you have missing data on one occasion. Um, and another issue here to think through is how are we going to center our predictors if we study um, two sets of variables that are both changing over time. So two issues here need to be um, paid attention to. The first thing is what is the form of change for the predictor variable before we, de um, we center it or detrend it? Is there a trend? If there is no trend, then using the average of um, each person's mean can meaningfully allow us to remove the between person differences and only retain the within person differences to predict the within person differences in the outcome variable. But when you have predictor variable themselves are changing over time, there's a, um, a, a general pattern, there's a trend, it's not just uh, randomly fluctuating, then it becomes more tricky how are you going to center your predictor variable so you can use the residual that's meaningfully reflecting the within person differences to explain the within person differences in the other variable. So this um, citation here, current power has a very uh, nice illustration of the different approaches and what are the different results you will get when adopting these different centering options. The, the second issue we need to think through when we study bivariate relationship that's two variables that's both changing over time, which also relates to some of the points Mike mentioned earlier, the, um, the between firm versus com uh, within firm heterogeneity. So same for people. So when we are studying two variables that's both with within the person it's been changing over time, we need to ask ourselves, are we more interested in the between person relationships, which we are studying the relation correlation or relationship between the person means on these two variables, or are we interested in the within person relationship between these two variables, or is, is it a combination of those? So here, uh, uh, just for illustrative purpose, I have three data, three clusters of data from three people, for example. And on the left hand side, we can see in general when we don't think about where the data are from, which cluster it is from. In general, there's a weak positive relationship between these two variables. But if we decompose it, uh, we can see that at the between person level, at the person level, there's a positive correlation, but at the within person level, there's a negative, negative correlation on these two variables. So these can if we didn't handle this properly in our theorizing and our data analysis, we can reach very different conclusions. So that concludes my high-level high overview of longitudinal analysis in OB micro research, and here are some recommended readings. And I will exit my slides and open up for questions. Thank you, Betty. Uh, let me pull up the questions I have saved. Uh, so the first question for Betty is, uh, I'm interested in studying the consequences of intra individual change stability. Uh, could you recommend some literature to learn about how to approach analyze panel data uh, with this question in mind? Yeah, thank you. Um, so if your research area, the, the program research you're doing is mostly concerned about within person 
changes and stability, then I think a good place to start is to um, look at some example papers as well as high level overview from research that's uh, often adopting experience sampling method, for example, to collect data and analyze data. Because when you are um, using this type of data collection method to answer this type of question, um, often you need to find a meaningful way to decompose your within person variances and between person variances. So uh, understanding how do you decompose the variances and then how do you properly specify the statistical model. So you are only testing your relationship that's realized at the within person level. I think that that's the key. Great, thank you. Uh, so question two. So while looking at uh, longitudinal analysis at the uh, micro level, specifically multivariate latent growth model is the is the univariate or multivariate assumption testing similar to any sem analysis i assume the question is about uh, the normal distribution assumption in this particular question uh, yeah any thoughts on that yeah um so i i think the um, when, when you think about the latent growth modeling approach to analyze growth data, um, it, everything is actually the same as the general SCM framework because it's just a special application of SCM. Um, here, the latent variables are representing conceptually what we think is an intercept and what we think is a growth rate on this series of variables we observe. So, so a simple answer is yes. So you will need to follow all the general guidance um, or assumptions of using SCM. Great. By the way, I will have a few general questions to all three panelists after we go over uh, these particular questions for, for Betty. So question number three, uh, if I'm testing variables that I expected to change daily, uh, like in the experience sampling approach, uh, is it okay to collect data every two days or, every, uh, or over three time points within a single week? Describe it as longitudinal or what is the minimum required interval that can justify such a research question? Yeah, so um, I, I think it's, I'm sorry, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, so in, in, in experience sampling study, or uh, sometimes in the, in the earlier days, often it's uh, conducted daily. So sometimes people call it diary studies. So it's often daily, but, um, but within that, it's actually a set of choices you need to make because you can use event-based trigger to ask people to respond, or you can use fixed interval. So say every half a day, every three days, you respond. Or it can also be um, some sort of frequency-based, but uh, you have a specific research question that drives your design of the interval. Uh, or it can be a combination, like say you, you tell the participants every day you will respond this, but if you experience this event, you should also respond about this. Uh, or it can be random, right? So sometimes you will tell them in general, you will get how many prompts to respond, but when you get the, the reminder randomly, then you will respond. Um, so there are a series of choices you can make, and um, it, it doesn't actually. When you get to the analysis, it's it's pretty simple to handle all of this because you are essentially planning the the quote unquote missing in your in, in a balanced data format. So uh, a good uh, reference to look at is uh, Dan Bill's review in any review of organizational psychology and organizational behavior research. Uh, I think in 20, 2015 or 2013, he uh, had a review of the series of choices researchers can make to design um, daily data collection. Great. So uh, we answered all those three questions. Now I would like to ask the three panelists a general question. Uh, and you guys are definitely experts in the topic area you have been covering. Uh, so I, I am asking this on behalf of the audience. Uh, they probably want to know when you started to, you know, to learn these methods or the set of methods that you, you are using right now. Uh, are there any lessons you can share with us in terms of uh, you know, the best way, most effective way to learn uh, and, uh, and, and master new methods? Uh, and any uh, pitfalls that we should be avoiding uh, and can save some time uh, for the audience learning of new methods, getting into a new area. Uh, whoever wants to go first. Uh, I guess it's a tough question, right? 
Um, yeah, I, I, I can, thank you. Yeah, I can go first. Uh, thank you for the interesting questions. And of course, the obvious, the obvious, I'm going to say the obvious is really learning by doing and practicing the methods. Uh, it was uh, crucial early on uh, doing my PhD. But also the second point is identifying a community of uh, method people, since we are part of Karma here and uh, and the research method division QCA had the lack of having also a multidisciplinary community of people interested in the method and hanging out with them in terms of the conferences, figuring out where those events and training moments uh, occur was a big help on my side, really figuring out where the community meets. Okay, so can you give us a few uh, specific suggestions in terms of uh, when the workshops other than the current one on QCA maybe offered uh, academy of management or other smaller regional conferences? Sure, sure. I mean, uh, for QCA, there is a PDW that we've been running together with Thomas, Piofis, Virmo um, Misanji yeah. and others as part of the academy of management co-sponsored co by the research method division. It will run this year virtually as well, but uh, we've been running this for 11 years and uh, has been very well attended. That's one venue, PDW, QCA at the AOM, co-sponsored by several divisions. Another very good source is the website that is in the last slide I presented, which is Compass with three S, not two S. I know it sounds weird, but Compass with three S. And you will see the list of events, training, but also just conferences or workshop where you can present your paper development, your papers on QCA. And basically this website really put together all QCA resources, including software events and training. So I highly recommend it really for those of you interested. Great, thank you. Mike? Uh, so I would say um, to, to kind of follow up on, on, on Santi's point, really uh, engaging in these methods is the best way to, to learn them no matter what method you're thinking about. I, I also think uh, recognizing that we all start at different points, almost our intercepts are different, right? And so thinking about that and recognizing that where, wherever you are on that, on that line and wherever you are on your kind of uh, slope, if you will, recognize that it's a learning process. And, uh, you know, I have, my, I have my students in my research methods class read uh, a paper by Shook and colleagues from 2003 in SMJ, and it talks about the fall off uh, for research methods after you leave your PhD program. I would say it doesn't have to be that. And, and you know, you see engaging with scholars, as Santi's saying, and having a community like Karma. Uh, SMS also has a community on research methods that, that uh, is, is available. And there are just a variety of great sources. I think the one nice thing, and we were kind of speaking about this at the beginning, you know, the, the uh, crisis that we are currently facing, one of the things that has been beneficial is the um, really expediting this type of learning right and i think more and more online content for methods having youtube videos to watch I, again i know there are just several sources uh, similar to the qca where if you're looking at any methods whether it's uh understanding ols all the way up to the more advanced methods there will be resources available to you and know that it just starts by that first step saying that you want to get better at it and the more you do the better you get and i think i've only benefited from having great advisors like Travis Serto and working with people like Matt Simadini. And I just kind of was diving in and, and that was the only way to really do it. And it's been, it's been a fun process doing it. And, and it really, I'm sure everyone on the panel feels the same way. You're excited about, about methodological questions and, and digging into it, whether you're looking at any number of things. And so I, I think that's the cool thing about research methods. So. Thank you, Mike. Uh, how about Betty? Yeah. Um, yeah, I totally agree with Sandy and what Mike mentioned. And I think um, in addition to that, also um, sometimes it's very easy to chase the shiny objects and get a little bit distracted by what's trendy. Uh, I think that's good because it will inspire you to have new ideas, but also um, have your program of research as the anchor. So you can know conceptually what do you need to get to answer it and how does that tool help you answer that? Because not all of us need to be the experts on the algorithm level how it's actually executed but we do need to know what it can answer and what are the limitations and assumptions and how does that connect back to your program research is this applicable um is this really you know giving you conclusion that's moving away too far from what is the reality in the phenomenon you're studying great 
thank you. Uh, I definitely share with Betty's uh, idea in terms of you don't have to really use the most cutting edge method to, to address a particular question. Uh, there was one case uh, that when I was working with Maria Kramer on, uh, on her team of AE at, uh, of social editors at uh, personnel psychology, uh, she actually accepted one paper, uh, but only realizing afterwards that the paper was only using OLS regression. But they were asking a, a very interesting question and the approach was appropriate to be tested uh, in the OLS regression uh, you know, phenomena as, as, as the context. So you do not have to go multi-level or dynamic panel or you know, the cutting edge data commands in order to uh, get your idea published. Uh, so that's something probably as kind of lesson I learned over the years too. Uh, so thank you three uh, for, for, the, for the experiences. Uh, but, but one little thing I want to add a little bit. So what are the, I, I guess Betty mentioned a little bit on this. So what are the uh, challenges or things that you can suggest to our audience that to avoid uh, when you start to beginning learning new methods? Uh, what are the pitfalls to, to get you know, around with? I'll say, that I think Betty was mentioning this, we don't need it in our field maybe to know how to write the proofs for some of these models and to build them out in that way. But I think having a clear understanding, and I completely agree with having your method fit your data and your research question is critical. But I think sometimes when we look at these more advanced methods, I, I think uh, the dynamic panel models are very complicated when you get in the Ariana Bond context and recognizing that complexity and trying as best as possible to understand what's going on. And I'm sure that's the same if you're looking at, especially a generalized structural equation model that's very complicated. And so I, I think that's a critical thing as well uh, to, to at least try to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. I think that, that always is a good question to ask. Why am I using this method too? Which goes back to, to Zen, your point. So. Great. Let's see. Uh, let's see the audience do the, uh, I'm, I'm assuming that audience will have more questions coming up. Uh, and we may not have enough time given we have only three minutes left. So I would encourage uh, the audience to contact, uh, you know, every one of you through email uh, to follow up with, with their questions uh, if they have some. Uh, particularly, you know, how to use the method and how to choose between uh, different methods. Uh, like for Santi's case, uh, people have been asking how to combine QCA with other known methods that have maybe have different purposes answering different questions what are the best ways to combine them and similar to betty uh, how to combine you know, those all you know seven eight different types of longitudinal data from ob macros research could be an interesting way to move forward uh, so i guess we are at the time so i would like to thank uh, all three panelists uh sandy mike and betty for your time and for sharing your knowledge. Uh, and uh, I, I'm pretty certain that the slides will be shared and the video will be ready afterwards. Uh, so for the audience, if you have follow-up questions, feel free to contact them. And also for your, if you have questions, uh, the, you know, there's one perfect or you know, fabulous way of asking for experts, which is the RM divisions mailing list. So if you are not a member yet, please consider to sign up uh, to be a member of the research methods division because membership will determine the workshops we offer uh, in, in every year for the, during the academy conference. So I want to shout out to thank Larry Williams and Kama and thank uh, Thomas Greg Hammer for organizing and hosting this event for everyone uh, to improve and you know, continue our learning through our career. Uh, so I would like to, you know, with, with that said, I would like to give everyone a hand and applause to thank, thank the three panelists and everyone for accomplishing this, you know, this uh, two hour session, which is this great learning experience for us. Okay.